Right. Morning, everybody. Uh, getting used to technology again. I always forget how to use these things, but because uh, I tend to rely on chalk and talk rather than as on gizmos. Um, but I have to do gizmos, but I'm not very good at doing gizmos. But anyway, let's hope it works. Great to be back. Nice to see you all. Um, this time last year, we were on the cusp of the American presidential election, looking at the prospect of Donald Trump, which sadly was realized. Um, and we're all living with the, the consequences of that. But again, like last year, um, there's a lot to reflect on over the period since uh, last October. Um, and we're right in the middle of what we hope are going to be fruitful negotiations between and amongst the parties, most, you know, obviously between the DUP and and Sinn Féin, uh, and the mood music has seemed to oscillate over the past couple of months, you know, uh, one period it all looks terribly gloomy and another it looks as it were that it may, it may bear fruit, which is why I've kind of subtitled this as a great A.A. A. Milne and Win Winnie the Pooh fan, um, uh, whether it's Tigger bouncing full of energy and enthusiasm and believing that everything will be all right on the night, or, which is, tends to be my default position, actually, Eeyore, uh, which is that everything is really glum and we can all feel justifiably despondent about, about the immediate future. But it's actually difficult to call because, um, you know, I don't know which way this is going to go. Um, one of the things we know at the moment, given what James Brokenshire had to say on Sunday, is that we've got the most of this month, October, for the parties to try and come to some kind of resolution. But maybe we'll come on to that in a bit. So let's have a, have a look back then over the, over the past year. Um, and in January, of course, I mean, everything really was sent into flux with Martin McGuinness's announcement that he was going to resign as Deputy First Minister. Um, and that resignation automatically then really triggered uh, a fresh assembly election because with Martin McGuinness resigning, of course, it meant that Arlene Fosser could no longer continue as First Minister because those two roles are conjoined. They're like conjoined or Siamese twins. You know, you, they are inextricably, mm -hmm. to coin a phrase, linked. Um, so she had to resign too. And it's a sharp reminder of the power sharing or the codependency arrangements that our consociational model uh, established. Um, so the election was called. Uh, James Brokenshire really at that stage, I think, had very little alternative other than to call uh, for an assembly election. And that election was coached in enormous amount of rancor and bitterness and, of course, the RHI issue, which dominated the period leading up to the election and, of course, the election itself, and the assertions about um, Arlene Foster's role in the whole scandal, whether she was in any way culpable or not for what really is a major financial scandal in relation to, to policy. And it was a bitter campaign. And it was one that was reinforced by, of course, the outcome of the Brexit referendum here, where a majority of people did vote to remain within the European Union, whereas, of course, the DUP <coughs> was in favour of leave. Um, and that, as well, helped to structure really what proved to be a really quite acrimonious uh, election campaign, quite a bitter campaign, which, like all our election campaigns here to date, uh, as far as the unionists are concerned, particularly the DUP, has revolved around the issue of who becomes First Minister. And that, as it were, if you like, reinforces um, what we tend to call in Northern Ireland sectarian, or what I would prefer to call communal voting patterns. It just reinforces, as it were, the issue of who is going to occupy that totemic role as First Minister, because, of course, in reality, there is no distinction, as the presentation you've just seen, and you already know anyway, there is no formal distinction in terms of powers between the First and the Deputy First Minister. They are formally co-equal. But it was a really bitter campaign. Um, 
RHI figured very prominently. But for Sinn Féin in particular, um, and given Martin McGuinness's resignation, where in his resignation letter he bemoaned what he regarded as a lack of respect, a lack of integrity, um, a failure to deliver on our rights agenda uh, within uh, our model of devolution in terms of policy, all that fed into um, really a very divisive uh, uh, campaign, which produced some astonishing results. Now, of course, it was the first assembly election where we had just 90 members to elect, um, uh, and each constituency had just five seats to return instead of six, which had been the previous case, of course. Um, sorry, I should have moved this on. Um, so fewer seats overall, fewer seats in each constituency. Um, and there is a, a law uh, in electoral studies called uh, Tagapera's Law, which argues that the lower the number of members in the constituency and the fewer the constituencies there are, that small parties tend to get squeezed out. Okay. So that was the kind of operating assumption that certainly sophologists had in relation to the potential effects of this election, given the reduced number of members to be returned, and uh, one fewer in each of the 18 constituencies. But that law actually didn't seem to apply in relation to our election. You know, that you would predicate on the basis of that law that the Alliance, the Greens, and so on, the smaller parties would actually suffer most in terms of losing seats at the election. I'll come on to the seats in a moment. It's interesting that it was the highest turnout since 1998, um, the very first assembly election. It was 64, just a shade under 65% compared to 70% in 1998. Um, and given the assembly election of the previous year, there was a 10% increase in turnout in 2017, okay, over 2016. Um, and it increased significantly across all 18 constituencies. Okay. So you had a highly mobilised electorate uh, at the last assembly election in March, um, especially amongst nationalist voters. And it was in the predominantly nationalist constituencies where the turnout was highest. Okay. So you got this energised, highly mobilised, highly enthusiastic electorate, uh, and showing you know, that 10% increase in turnout, which is actually quite a remarkable increase in the space of 12 months. Okay. So what about party performances? Now, <clears throat> I think you're all going to get these slides, or we all have access to them, so um, it, they may look a bit detailed, but you'll have them to look at at your leisure. Well, I'll just briefly run through uh, some of the significant outcomes in relation to uh, the parties. Start with the DUP. Its total vote, its aggregate vote, went up okay, in 2017 by just around about 23,000, which was an 11% increase on the previous assembly election in 2016. Okay. But its vote share fell. Okay. It fell by 1%. That is, its share of the overall vote fell uh, to 28.1%. And that was its lowest vote share since 2003. So it had a profound effect on the uh, DUP, which was magnified to some extent, of course, by the reduction in the number of seats. But nevertheless, if you look at the turnout figures, um, it is, I think, noteworthy that um, its vote share fell. And in the process, it wasn't the smaller party here that was losing a lot of seats. It was actually the DUP. It lost 10 seats uh, 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 earlier this year achieving just 28 total out of the new figure of 90. Amongst other things, of course, that meant that the DUP could no longer uh, uh, table a petition of concern under its own steam, which was a very significant outcome of that election. Our Unionist Party, its vote went up compared to 2016 by 16,000, an 18% increase over the previous election. Um, its vote share also went up fractionally 
by 0.3 of a percent, but it lost six seats. Okay. So out of a total of 18 fewer seats overall, the two unionist parties lost 16 of them. Okay. Uh, it achieved just 10 out of the 90, and that's its worst performance at an assembly election since 1998. Okay. Sinn Féin, big story. Its aggregate vote went up by 57,000 over the previous year. So you can see there that there was a highly mobilized Republican electorate at uh, the election in March. This is more than a third increase over 2016. Okay. Overall, 4% just under, up to 27.9%, and it lost one seat, okay, which brought it down to 27. The SDLP, its vote also went up, um, uh, by 15%. Its vote share more or less remained the same. It was up 0.1%. It held, as it were, um, and it held its 12 seats. Okay. So for, for the SDLP, it was stability. Um, for Sinn Féin, significant growth. Uh, growth, too, for the two unionist parties, but they suffered in terms of seat numbers. Okay. The party that had the largest increase in its vote was Alliance. So, whereas the law suggests, Tiger, Tiger, Tiger Burke's law suggests that the smaller parties in reduced number of constituencies and seats would lose, actually, the Alliance party had the largest growth in terms of votes um, uh, at the election. It went up by 24,000, 50% increase on 2016. Um, its vote share went up to just over 9%, and it held all of its eight seats. Okay. The big story, then, was a massive surge in the nationalist vote, a tsunami, okay, uh, in terms of the increase in its aggregate vote. And Sinn Féin emerged just one seat behind the DUP, and only fractionally adrift of the DUP in terms of its total vote share just 0.2% behind. I just totted up the aggregate votes for DUP and UUP just to show, as it were, the, the, the grand effect in terms of where the electorate uh, went. If you total the DUP and UUP's votes, 328,000 for Sinn Féin and the SDLP, 320,000. So you can see that there is a convergence. And if you go back to 2003, and you look at the relative growth of the DUP and Sinn Féin votes since that period, you see that there is almost an exact parallel upward trajectory in terms of their, their vote, overall vote. Okay. It also meant the outcome that for the first time ever, there was no overall unionist majority in the, uh, not just the Assembly, but any parliament in Northern Ireland since partition. Okay. That's a first. Okay. Uh, if you total up all the unionists, 40, I think, if you total up all the nationalists and, and republicans, it's, it's 39, I think, from, mem from memory. So this then produced a profound shock for unionists. Now, this was not really anticipated, although Arlene Foster did say during the course of the election campaign that um, you know, the, a vote really did matter, that uh, there was anxiety about uh, how well uh, nationalists and particularly Republicans might do. But I don't think anybody foresaw the extent to which the electoral for fortunes of the DUP would suffer uh, and uh, Sinn Féin prosper at that particular election. And that, had a, you know, that really did remodel the political and electoral landscape in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, and for, for Republicans and, and many nationalists too, um, the outcome of that election stimulated a renewed call for border poll, um, be partly because of the, the stunning performance, really, by Sinn Féin, uh, the stability uh, that the SDLP managed to deliver, um, but that convergent growth in terms of you know, where votes are actually going in Northern Ireland. 
So from a period of relative, if you like, regime stability in Northern Ireland, the idea that devolution was a settled, stable uh, arrangement, the, uh, the, the election actually stimulated a lot of conversations about whether or not Northern Ireland was stable and was viable, given what some people interpreted to be a trend, a growing trend, towards, as it were, um, uh, uh, nationalism and republicanism. And it was compounded by the real uncertainties, which still exist, about the effects on Northern Ireland of Brexit and the fact that Northern Ireland had voted to remain in the European Union. So the results themselves and that wider context of Brexit, which is going to structure government, not only, and, and not only a current parliament, but probably much of the next parliament, the UK parliament as well, that context created a situation of, and a condition of real flux and uncertainty uh, in Northern Ireland. If the talks which are currently ongoing yield uh, a positive outcome, then the executive will get, will get based on the elections in, in March, uh, would be four DUP and three Sinn Féin, including the First and Deputy First Minister, one SDLP, one EUP, and either one Independent or Alliance, given, I think, that justice will go either back to Claire Sugden, who says she's relaxed about not taking it on again, uh, or uh, the Alliance Party. Now, it assumes, of course, that the SDLP and the LC Unionists no longer believe that, for them, opposition is uh, an option, that they feel, perhaps, that their fingers were burnt over that, exercising that option, uh, in uh, part, at least, of the last mandate, the previous mandate. Um, and I assume Alliance does, of course, of the smaller parties, it's the only one that qualifies officially to become a member of the official opposition, because it reached the threshold uh, of 8% of the, of, of the total, uh, total vote to formally become the opposition uh, in the chamber should it uh, meet. So there are a lot of then loose ends which were left as a consequence. The talks was, were kicked off. Um, there were a whole raft of very neurologic issues that really dominated the talks, in addition to the respect and rights and quality agenda that Sinn Féin had been pushing, of course. RHI bulked uh, large, uh, framing the context. There was the issue of petition of concern. We didn't know how long the talks would take. We still don't know, really, how long the talks might take. I think the lesson is at last been learned the deadlines actually don't work in Northern Ireland. Um, Single-sex marriage, or same-sex marriage, rather, the Irish Language Act, legacy issues, victims, and, of course, Arlene Foster's role. Uh, would Sinn Féin be prepared to nominate a deputy first minister if the DUP insisted on Arlene Foster becoming first minister? So all those issues, as it were, were bundled into this rather... Uh, very convoluted and very complicated talks process, which uh, is yet to be, to be uh, concluded. And then we had Theresa May walking in. I have to, we have to blame Wales here. She went for a walk with her husband in Snowdonia <laughs> and decided on her strolling through the wonderful scenery of North Wales... I think it's a good idea to have an election. I think she regrets having gone to Wales... Uh, uh, the consequence, um, and that, apart from anything else, of course, the, 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 the announcement of a snapdown election uh, meant that there would be um, uh, the, the talks process themselves would be arrested as a consequence of this while the parties readied themselves for uh, a general election. Um, and we headed into the June election. Uh, this year. Now, what that election did was it underlined and consolidated the dominance of the DUP and uh, Sinn Féin. Of the 18 seats, they took 17 of them. DUP taking 10, Sinn Féin 7, and of course one independent, uh, Sylvia Herman in North Down. So what we now have 
is a two-party system, basically, with at Westminster level, uh, uh, with um, uh, Sylvia Herman, the outlier in North Down. The only two parties to increase their vote at the general election over the previous general election were the DUP and Sinn Féin. The DUP vote went up by 10%, Sinn Féin's by a fraction under 5%. So the electorate, if you like, lifted up its skirts, collective skirts, and retreated into one camp or the other, essentially. That's what happened. Um, uh, it consolidated, if you like, what we can call, I think now, a diarchy in Northern Ireland at Westminster level. It meant overall across the UK that there was no overall majority for the Conservative Party and so they then entered into this confidence and supply agreement with the DUP in order, as it were, to muster some kind of majority on confidence issues and supply issues in the House of Commons that basically budget key financial decisions. Okay. Um, and then the much mooted and highly controversial issue of the billion and a half pounds that's meant to come to Northern Ireland as a consequence of that competence and su supply arrangement. No money has come yet, and the government recently seems to be cleaving to the view that it won't come unless we get devolution back up and running. Okay. So when Jeremy Corbyn said last week, for example, that uh, the competence and supply arrangement meant that uh, the DUP could spend the money on pet projects, I think was the phrase he actually used in one interview he gave, is completely wrong because the money, if, if and when it does come, comes to the executive as a whole, which then has, as it were, to make decisions about how, that, how those resources, how that money will be allocated across, oops, across the, uh, the nine departments here. Um, it's not in the DU's, DUP's gift to allocate that money at all but it's now seemingly contingent on devolution being restored. It also meant that with the defeat of the SDLP's three candidates, there was no nationalist voice in the House of Commons, and given Sinn Féin's continuing abstentionism, of course. And <clears throat> I don't think there are any nationalist voices in the House of Lords either. Um, so there is no nationalist voice as such at Westminster currently. And then the talks were extended, renewed, and are ongoing. So with the devolution, where do we go from here? Uh, this rather complex uh, situation we're in. Are there reasons to be cheerful, uh, like Tigger, or cheerless, like Eeyore? Well, we can rehearse thinkable options for the foreseeable future. Uh, here, James Brokenshire could and is legally seemingly obliged to call a fresh election if there is no agreement at the talks. I think that is extremely unlikely. Um, I don't think the DUP or Sinn Féin now fear another election anyway. I think the, the scare that the unionist community had in March at the assembly election, that scare has been ameliorated by the outcome of the general election where the DUP increased its number of seats and increased its vote significantly. Um, and I don't think Sinn Féin either fear uh, uh, another election. And I don't see, and I don't think the NIO actually uh, see how in any way, a fresh election will actually assist and help to oil the wheels of the ongoing talks process. So I think it's extremely unlikely that we'll get an election. Um, uh, um, some people have been talking about November. Um, um, I, I just don't see it, of course. You know, who knows? I could be proved completely wrong. But I think it's very, very unlikely. Um, direct rule, of course, is the most obvious, if you like, alternative. Um, now, a couple of points about direct rule, and I'll, 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 um, I'll come back to this shortly. The broad point to make about direct rule is it is an incredibly blunt instrument 
or Gravening, Northern Ireland. Okay. Um, among other things, I know that the establishment, the staff level in the NIO has been significantly reduced okay. um, as a consequence of the austerity measures undertaken by the Conservative and Lib Dems post-2010. And like other departments, uh, the NIO has suffered significantly. It's lost well over 100 members of staff. So in terms of their own capabilities and resources, actually they're quite stretched. Uh, and I think that would create problems for them if and when we did get direct rule. I'll come back to Dirk. Let me move on just briefly on to the idea of uh, joint authority. Now, a lot of people uh, in the wake of the Assembly election and indeed the general election, a lot of Republicans in particular, uh, Martina Anderson, I think perhaps most vocally, uh, raised the option of joint authority. That is, the Northern Ireland would become like a condominium co-governed by London and Dublin. The apparent basis for that option, um, which uh, Martina, among others, uh, uh, claim gives it credibility and authority, was a one-page note penned by Bertie O'Hearn and Tony Blair in 2006, in April 2006, where the two Prime Ministers, Bertie and, and Tony Blair, talked about joint stewardship of Northern Ireland, should the then talks fail. Okay. Now, they never defined what joint stewardship meant. Okay. Uh, some officials were talking about, to use a phrase employed by one of them, a greener form of direct rule. Okay. The maximalist interpretation of that is uh, a, the Northern Ireland becomes, in effect, a condominium co-governed by the two governments uh, with co-equal authority over matters internal to Northern Ireland. The more minimalist interpretation would be rather like, uh, if you like to draw a parallel, would be the anglo irish Agreement of 1985, when Gary Fitzgerald said that uh, what that provided was um, more than consultation, but less than executive authority. So some kind of um, ground where the Irish government has an input into the internal governance of Northern Ireland, but has no executive authority uh, over Northern Ireland, which joint authority would actually entail. Okay. The maximalist interpretation joint authority, for which there is no legal or textual basis, okay, um, uh, has been ruled out by the, the UK government on successive occasions and utterly firmly. Apart from anything else, joint authority would betray the consent principle because joint authority would mean that the constitutional status of Northern Ireland would change change radically because it would be co-governed by two sovereign actors, Ireland and the UK. So as early as January this year, uh, it was ruled out of, dismissed out of hand by the UK government in the House of Lords, and more recently it's been dismissed in the House of Commons as well. Um, but there is this vague territory described as joint stewardship, which you have a, a writ for in that 2006 note that Blair and Hearn uh, penned, but we don't actually know what that means. And anyway, the undertakings, give, undertaking, undertakings given by previous administrations are not binding on current administrations. So there is nothing, as it were, to assume that because joint stewardship, which, as I say, was left unexplored, um, was set down on paper by Ahern and Blair. There is nothing tying the hands of um, Leo Varadka and Theresa May in terms of that. There is no necessary, <coughs> excuse me, continuity in policy, even though that policy is utterly vague and undefined. Okay. So joint authority is not a runner. Joint stewardship 
could be, um, depending on exactly what it means. I don't think it would mean much more than um, currently what we have. Um, one interesting thing did happen in the wake of the collapse of the institutions in 2002, in October, about a month later, there was a new treaty between London and Dublin, which enabled the two governments to keep the cross-border bodies ticking over, even though devolution was suspended. Now, in fact, that actually um, uh, was a contradiction of the Good Friday Agreement itself and the provisions therein, which said that if any one of the institutions which had been established collapsed, then everything collapsed. But in fact, the Irish and the British, back in 2002, signed this new treaty, which enabled the cross-border bodies to continue operating, even though the Assembly and the Executive were suspended uh, during that direct rule period, which lasted, of course, more than four and a half years. So there is provision to enable London and Dublin to cooperate on cross-border matters. And in fact, I think that was what was in the minds of Blair and Ahern in 2006. It wasn't to do with what was going on in terms of the Assembly or the Executive. It was more to do, I think, with what might happen in relation to cross-border matters. Now, those cross-border bodies did continue to exist and function, but it was on really a care and maintenance basis. There were no radical or even insignificant policy changes as a consequence of that arrangement, but that could be revived as a means of, if you like, jointly stewarding um, the, the institutions in the, in, in the light of any failure of the current talks process. Another option, which has been Jim Allister's B in his bonnet ever since, as it were, he, he became an MLA, is the idea of voluntary coalition. Uh, whereby two, three, whatever, however number of parties that they would come together and present themselves as uh, willing partners in a coalition rather than, as he would see it, the mandatory coalition provision, which brings you know, opposites or tries to bring opposites together in one administration. The problem with voluntary coalition is that it betrays the core principle of the Belfast Agreement, uh, which is inclusiveness. The very idea of uh, a consociational model, uh, and certainly the thinking behind the design of our specific model, was to bring as many people as possible into, as it were, government and into uh, the assembly. I also think that given the outcome of the, the election in, in March, actually it would be quite difficult now to manufacture a majority of 46 MLAs to, to produce a voluntary coalition. It's not impossible. But it would be difficult if you look at the numbers. Uh, who's going to ally perhaps with the DUP in some kind of voluntary coalition? Presumably, perhaps the Ulster Unionists, that would bring them up to 37. They're still, uh, sorry, 38. They're still eight shy of a majority. Where would they get those other eight members? Would Alliance be prepared to go into a voluntary coalition with the DUP and the Ulster Unionists? Who would be prepared to ally with Sinn Féin, with its 27 MLAs, in order to achieve the 46 threshold? You know, it's, it's difficult, given the numbers, to actually see how that majority could be manufactured uh, in our current context. Not impossible, but it's difficult to envisage. Um, if we did get a voluntary coalition, Rather than it going, you know, sort of every vote going to 46, 44 in the new assembly, what you could do is, on key decisions, uh, introduce a weighted majority system. So, for example, on things like the programme for government or the budget, uh, there could be a provision for a weighted majority, say, of two-thirds of the members would have to vote in support of either in order for it to pass, and that would mean 60 members. So... Again, it's something which is thinkable, but whether or not it's politically uh, achievable, I think is another matter. Okay. Now, uh, oh, oh uh, yes, uh, border poll. The, the, the legislation provides that a border poll can be called if the Secretary of State is convinced that there is sufficient support for change in the constitutional status of Northern Ireland, okay? And he would, or she, 
would base that decision on election results, on opinion polling. Um, the NIO does its own private polling as well as the polling you see in the Belfast Telegraph, for example, by Lucid Talk. Um, but it has to be an evidence-based decision. Okay. Uh, it's not something that you could, in a piece of whimsy, you know, well, we'll have a border poll. And you can't have a border poll in order to confirm the status quo, which is that Northern Ireland is a constituent part of the United Kingdom. David Trimble tried that back in 2003, and of course he was batted away. You don't hold one to confirm Northern Ireland's position in the United Kingdom. It can only be held if the evidence is there and if there is a perceived demand for change in the constitutional status of Northern Ireland. Um, now, direct rule, um, which could happen. I mean, let's face it. I mean, it is, it, it is, it is a very thinkable alternative. Um, it last happened in between 2002 and 2007. Um, so 55 months we had of direct rule. Um, when the thing last collapsed. For the UK government, this is a ve they'd be very reluctant to do this. Not least, of course, because at central government level, their hands are absolutely full with Brexit. Okay. It, is, it, it will dominate this parliament in point terms of not just the negotiations, but the legislative agenda of parliament is going to be overwhelmed by Brexit issues, Brexit-related issues. Um, they're very resource poor uh, in terms of dealing with Brexit as it is, um, I think. They're still, you know, the, the Brexit department, the one that David Davis holds, is still understaffed. Um, the idea that the depleted NIO is going to be the beneficiary of civil servants being moved there in order to help administer direct rule. And let's, of course, officials from the Assembly, and I think there was a note that went round uh, in the last week or so, suggesting to staff here that they might want to actively start thinking about being temporarily located or relocated in one of the departments, um, given that there is very little going on actually within the Assembly itself. Um, uh, and that that might be an option they choose to exercise now before they are, as it were, directed to uh, one or other of the one or other of the departments. In order to introduce direct rule, the UK government would have to introduce new legislation in Westminster on this already cluttered timetable. Now, I'm not saying that they couldn't do that. Of course, they could, and they could do it very quickly if they so chose. But they would need fresh legislation because the power to suspend formally the institutions by central government disappeared with the St. Andrews Act. Okay. It was a demand uh, by Sinn Féin and the SDLP that the power that the UK government had to suspend be um, abandoned. And in fact, that's what happened. Um, so in order to formally suspend afresh, they would have to introduce a new act or dust the old one down, as it were, and retable it in order to give the authority, the legislative authority, to introduce the rectoral. So, and there could be hiccups along the way in Parliament should that happen. And of course, what we don't know is what the Dublin view might be. In, they'd be very reluctant to see it. I think more reluctant probably than the UK government. But given this potential joint stewardship role, the role that Dublin would have to play in this arrangement would have to be clarified to Dublin's satisfaction. I think. Um, less than executive, more than consultative, or some variation on that would have to be agreed, I think, between the two sovereign governments. And if we were to have direct rule, which would mean certainly the ministerial team in the NIO would be expanded, um, you'd need more than the two ministers they currently have to oversee the nine departments, I think, and to take responsibility for them. Um, so they would need uh, a greater ministerial presence. The decision is a key strategic decision that the UK government, I think, uh, supported, they would hope, by Dublin, would be, well, should we exercise direct rule in a very muscular 
heavy way, you know, and make key decisions on issues which are bedeviling the, the, the parties locally. So, for example, um, same-sex marriage or abortion rights um, or issues about the allocation of financial resources. You know, do they go at this directorial regime, which would be you know, reintroduced, with gusto, you know, with a clear sense of direction, policy uh, priorities that they want to see enacted? Okay. Or, on the contrary, do they go for a light touch arrangement, at least initially, which is not to do nothing, but to do relatively little, so that it doesn't make any future talks more difficult to uh, resolve. Now, one issue that they're going to have to resolve, and I think Brokenshire did make this clear on Sunday, was that by the third week of this month, Northern Ireland's going to need a budget. That would be unavoidable. There has to be a budget. Um, uh, be, you know, ASAP, basically. So they would have to deal with the budget. And don't forget that when we first had devolution back in 1999 into 2000, and we had our first crisis in February of 2000, and directorial uh, was reintroduced for about five months uh, in 2000, the very first Northern Ireland budget in the devolution period was actually struck by the then UK government, by the then UK Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Peter Mandelson. It wasn't homegrown, it was actually produced by, by the then Labour government, that very first budget. So that's something it would uh, have to do, and I, I, my, my suspicion would be that they'll go for the light option in order to keep the door or the window of opportunity, wherever cliché is used, uh, as, uh, as open as possible so as not to queer the pitch for any renewed talks uh, between and amongst the parties here in Northern Ireland. That would be their initial, I think, instinct, is, you know, don't rock the boat too much. We're reluctant to do direct rule, but we, if we have to do it, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to overcomplicate uh, the, uh, the, the terrain. Uh, and then, of course, we have Brexit. Well, um, Secretary of State is Northern Ireland's voice at Westminster and Westminster's voice in Northern Ireland, okay? Um, and many Secretaries of State have been criticised for being, as it were, more Westminster's voice in Northern Ireland than Northern Ireland's voice at Westminster. Now, the issue here it would be, if we did get a rectoral, what would the Secretary of State's ro uh, role be in relation to Northern Ireland? How much would he fight, as it were, the corner for Northern Ireland, especially, of course, given this incredibly vexed issue of the border. Uh, now, David, I think he was coming on uh, uh, later, uh, I'm sure will rehearse all the particular options, all the, the, the thinkable options that there are for resolving the border. But if we had direct rule, it would be then for James Brokenshire, the current incumbent, to represent Northern Ireland's voice in the Brexit negotiations at the top tables. Now, one of the top tables is... Um, the Joint Ministerial Committee on the EU. Now, this is a new committee that was established by central government to deal with Brexit issues. And that committee, which is, involves the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, David Davis, it also has on it representatives from the devolved administrations, Scotland, Wales, and in theory, Northern Ireland. And amongst them, the issues that it is meant to deal with are what happens to devolution when all the EU laws are repatriated to the UK, to central government, and which of those laws should be devolved outwards to Edinburgh, Cardiff, and notionally Belfast, okay? Now, the devolved administrations clearly have a strategic role to play in the discussions that try to resolve those matters. We ain't at it. We would rely, or haven't been at it, and in fact, that committee has not met since February this year. Okay. So even though there's formal provision for that joint ministerial committee, it actually hasn't been meeting. So there are a whole raft of issues 
in relation to which of those repatriated powers are devolved out from the center. Uh, we would have to rely on Broken Shire in those circumstances to represent our interests, not only at that committee, but at other committees too. And yet the territory, at the very top cabinet committee dealing with Brexit, um, the, the regional secretaries of state or the territorial secretaries of state for Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland only attend that top, really top table committee uh, when, when necessary, I think is the form of words. So he's not there permanently as a member of the top tier cabinet committee, okay? Neither are the secretaries of state for Scotland or Wales. So there's anxiety in Cardiff, Edinburgh and here about the extent to which the devolved territories, their voices are being heard at the centre. And that's a particular issue for us, of course, um, given if, if, we, if we did end up with, uh, with the right rule. Can he be trusted, as it were, to, to be Northern Ireland's voice? And the problem is, of course, politically, that there is no one voice on Brexit in Northern Ireland. We, yes, we voted to remain, but <laughs> the dominant party is a lever. Uh, the, dominant, the, the, the leading party in relation to remain, Sinn Féin, doesn't go to Westminster. So... You know, which voice is he going, to, as it were, to try to echo in those top table talks? It's going to be the UK's voice, primarily. The other thing about direct rule, of course, is that if we do get it back, then the level and the quality of accountability and scrutiny is going to be diminished. There's no question about that. Um, the last time we had direct rule, 2002-2007, um, Westminster tried to accommodate Northern Ireland business by, for example, uh, enabling the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee to establish subcommittees to deal with scrutiny of Northern Ireland business. It was trying to spread the load, as it were. Um, that subcommittee arrangement didn't last very long, actually. Um, but we would have to, have to rely on the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee and our 10 MPs who sit on a variety of other select committees um, to scrutinise Northern Ireland business and matters at Westminster. Well, you know, it's going to be a very poor substitute for local accountability and local scrutiny. So in that sense, direct rule is no panacea for ensuring, through scrutiny, good government in, in Northern Ireland. Okay. It's, it's, uh, and legislatively, of course, uh, most legislation under direct rule goes through ordering council rather than its primary legislation, and ordering council procedures are very, very blunt um, you know, the, the, the level of scrutiny which is attached to secondary legislation, which is what orders are, uh, pales into insignificance compared to the scrutiny associated with primary legislation. Okay. Um, so, if you wish for direct rule, what in effect you're wishing for is an impoverished form of accountability uh, and representation of Northern Ireland at Westminster. Um, we could get, uh, as a consequence of the Brexit negotiations, um, a hard border. You know, the, the no deal is better than a bad deal. The cliff edge, the WTO option. Um, and I don't know whether you, you saw last week that there was a letter that went around from senior civil servants in Whitehall and Lord Harris, who had been uh, Britain's commissioner in the European Union until very recently, he resigned uh, shortly after Theresa May became Prime Minister. Um, if we're serious about No Deal, then what prep are we doing for No Deal? What are the plans if we fall off that cliff edge? And there's very little work apparently being done on the No Deal option, should it happen. But if it does happen, it's going to re-stimulate again calls for 
uh, a border pill. I think that's inevitable, should we get a hard border. Now, we don't know what border we're going to get, but uh, whether it's soft, you know, Goldilocks in the three beds, you know, the hard bed, the soft bed, or a bed that's just right, well, we don't know, we have no idea. But it will, I think, if it turns out to be a hard border, it, it, will, it will definitely, as it will, reignite passion behind a campaign for unification of Ireland. And that's been given a kind of nudge in a way, because given that the majority of people here voted to remain, uh, the EU has already made it clear that should, at some point, Northern Ireland vote to become, as it were, uh, to be reunited with uh, the Irish Republic, then consequentially, Northern Ireland would be readmitted as of right into the European Union, okay? um, uh, because it you know, has joined in two, uh, uh, a member a state who's al which is already a member uh, of the European Union. So with the, um, I don't think I've got any other slides. Uh, no, I haven't. Um, with the outcomes of the two elections, uh, Brexit, the antipathy between uh, uh, the DUP and Sinn Féin, um, it's very difficult, I think, to foresee anything other than a rather fluid, rather than a strong and stable, to kind of phrase, uh, uh, future for, uh, for Northern Ireland. I think everything really is in flux at the moment. The future is uncertain. And yet, despite all this confusion and, and you know, mutual antipathy, and it's not, you know, it seems at times rather than it being about priority of esteem between the DUP and Sinn Féin, it's about priority of contempt between DUP and Sinn Féin, which creates a very poisonous kind of political climate. Um, but even in that context, devolution remains the favoured outcome of the electorate in Northern Ireland. The warts and all, as it were. And despite for some, the clamant demand for direct rule and the clamant demand, among others, for unification via, via border poll. The majority in Northern Ireland still cleave to a belief in devolved institutions, maybe for different reasons. Maybe unionists see it as a terminus, a halfway house between um, unification and remaining within the UK. Sinn Féin perhaps see it as as Jerry Adams once put it, a stepping stone to a United Ireland. Sinn Féin need the devolved institutions to work in order to demonstrate that it is a competent and effective and efficient partner in government. And of course, it, it um, aspires to become a junior coalition partner in, uh, in Dublin. So, so I think a lot of people have been saying that Sinn Féin's heart's not really in this. Uh, in trying to get the institutions up and running, I think strategically they need devolution to succeed. So maybe that lifts the cloud of uncertainty a bit. DUP is committed to, to devolution, always has been a devolutionist party. So uncharacteristically, perhaps, I'm going to end up with Tigger rather than Eeyore. Now, um, I can't quite see how and when this is going to happen, but I think the mood music seems to have changed and it seems to be mood music that is more productive um, uh, and likely, as it were, to yield fruit. But let's wait and see what the next three weeks brings. I'm not going to look any further ahead than that um, because things can change so abruptly and so quickly. Theresa May may not survive the Conservative Party conference. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Um, and I'll stop there. <laughs>